Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Um, today, we're going to be talking about creating and submitting NIMAS files to the NIMAC. Uh, my name is Nicole Gaines, and I am the project director for the NIMAC, and I'm joined this afternoon with Liz Schaller. She's the new NIMAC manager, and she's going to help this afternoon to help keep track of any questions that come through on the text. Um, just as a couple of housekeeping things, I do want to note that the presentation today and the PowerPoint will be archived, so they will be available on the website for future reference, and the PowerPoint will be available for download if you are interested in keeping it as a reference, so it will be available to you. Um, there will be time during the presentation, I hope, for questions, uh, but I would ask that if you are not asking a question, especially if you are dialing in, if you could uh, just keep yourself on mute uh, in general just to avoid background noise. So I'm um, going to go ahead and get started with today's presentation and, and basically there are going to be two major chunks. The first one is going to talk a little bit about preparing NIMAS files, some key resources, uh, metadata requirements, a few different tools that we make available to help you in preparing NIMAS files, and then we're going to wrap that section up talking about just a few reminders and pointers for when you're preparing your files. And then the second part is going to talk about the batch submission process. This is a process that uh, was greatly simplified uh, in the last couple of years. Um, we're going to just talk about uh, how that process works and how to understand the daily FTP report when you do submit files. And then we'll have a, an opportunity for questions. And we may have uh, some opportunities for questions as we go along as well. So, uh, but if you think of something and you want to put it in the text box, please feel free to do that. And if you have a microphone, we'll also be able to take questions that way later on. So to start out with, I want to talk about the NIMA specification itself and the structure guidelines. When it comes to preparing NIMAS, if you are directly involved in this process, uh, three resources that I hope that you're already very well acquainted with. Uh, and if you're not, I want to be sure that you're looped in. Uh, the NIMAS specification is the first. Uh, the DAISY structure guidelines is the second. And the NIMAC metadata requirements uh, is the third. Th these are really the core resources to ensure that you are preparing high quality, valid NIMAS files uh, that also meet all of the metadata requirements for submission. So just as kind of a refresher, uh, if you were a participant in the first part of this webinar, two-part webinar series, we talked a little bit about the NIMAS specification itself. But just as a refresher, NIMAS is the only file format that we can accept. NIMAS 1.1 is the current specification. And uh, the technical specification basically defines the file set components, which are the XML file for the textual portion, an OPF file that includes required metadata and a manifest section, uh, a PDF only of the cover, title, uh, title page, copyright page, uh, you know, basically the essential pieces of the hard copy book that have the key metadata, bibliographic information that's required uh, in that PDF, and also an images folder, which is going to include all of the images from the print book. So. The other thing that the specification does, of course, is that it uh, defines the baseline element set for use in XML tagging. Uh, as we mentioned in the earlier uh, webinar, NIMAS is a subset of the DAISY standard. It is not the full DAISY standard. There are components that are present in full DAISY that are not present in NIMAS, but when it comes to uh, the element set, and the baseline element set, those, those are taken directly from uh, the DAISY standard. So this is just a screenshot here of the National Center on Accessible Educational Materials. Um, they, For short, they actually are known more as just the National AIM Center. They have historically been the primary uh, project under the U.S. Department of Education for providing technical support to publishers and conversion vendors regarding producing NIMAS, preparing files in the technical specification. You can find the technical specification on their website. 
So in addition to the baseline element set, there are some expanded elements that can be included. Uh, and MathML is also optional tagging that can be supplied in NIMIS if you wish. Um, one of the things that I always like to, to uh, mention when we talk about going to the to the actual uh, technical specification. One piece of that that's not up to date uh, regards the metadata, and that's simply because back when the regulations were put together, those uh, re requirements were preliminary, and so we always want to refer folks to the current NIMAC metadata guidelines for for the actual current up to date uh, metadata schemas, requirements, uh, optional, and required metadata. So aside from the specification, um, the next really major uh, piece of documentation in terms of creating NIMIS are the DAISY structure guidelines. Um, so in addition to using the baseline element set and ensuring that your file set includes all of those required components, it's really important that the tagging of the print book content, content be done in accordance with the DAISY structure guidelines. And this basically, um, it really helps ensure that, that the files are tagged correctly and that they'll be usable in producing accessible formats. One of the things that is important to keep in mind is that because NIMIS is a source file format, the users out in the states that are downloading your files, they're taking those files and they're using those in Braille translation software, other conversion software to produce the formats that are actually going to the students. And so that software, you know, it, it is making assumptions that those files are going to be tagged correctly, that the different types of content, whether that's tables or lists or sidebars or table of contents or whatever specific type of content it is, that it is tagged accordingly. And so the translated format, again, whether that's Braille or large print or uh, what have you, that that will also uh, be formatted correctly for the material. It's really important also to note that uh, automated validation cannot evaluate your adherence to the structure guidelines. Um, and this is one, one issue that's just kind of a it, it really is kind of a big limitation in terms of um, when it comes to that specific aspect of providing valid NIMIS, the specification itself says files must be tagged in accordance to the DAISY structure guidelines. The reality is there's not an automated way for that to be detected. Validation can't detect that. Uh, and, and we really rely on uh, publishers and conversion vendors to uh, conform and to comply and to utilize these resources to ensure that they're providing high quality files. In practice, you know, the NIMAC itself, we don't receive hard copy print books. And even if we did, it would not be feasible for us to be going and trying to do a page by page comparison of, oh, hey, that's a table. They coded it as a list and that's not right. It's just not feasible. Um, so, Generally speaking, I mean, I'm actually happy to say that we receive very few reports of issues with files, but generally, if something isn't tagged correctly for the content, that is something that we're going to hear about because it was a problem in creating the accessible format. So if we hear back regarding that, that's something that we could possibly circle back around if there's an issue with the file after it has been accepted into the repository. So in terms of using the DAISY structure guidelines, if you haven't utilized the resource before, or even if you have and you just kind of, if it's been a while, um, there are a couple of different ways that you can uh, use the resource. It is, it is found on the web, and there's a contents page for the overall DAISY structure guidelines document, and there's also a a place that you can go, there's an index for the specific tags. And I've included both of those links here because I find both of them useful in different situations. So this is a, just a screen capture here of that index. Um, I personally, if I have questions, if I'm looking at a file and something looks, it looks a little off, um, I will actually go to this index and I can find, uh, you know, I've got an example here. If you click the in the index for sidebar, it'll take you to a very brief definition of the element and then a link where you can get to the details. Uh, once you get to the details, it's it's really nicely organized. I really like the way that um, 
the DAISY Consortium put the resource together because it, you will always have, for the tag, you will have the definition, you'll have the syntax, you'll have any note about, you know, the most recent release of the standards, and then you will usually get a, a range of different examples um, for using the tag. And um, in a lot of cases, that'll even include uh, actual images from hard copy print books that say, here's what the actual books looks like, here's how that would be tagged. And so it's it's really, the, especially those examples can be, can be super helpful. Another section that I just want to kind of point out specifically is that, that in terms of the overall structure of that XML file for your book, if you want to uh, review that, there is a section called major structural elements that can be very helpful with that. Um, and I've actually, just a, by way of example for that section, I've provided uh, the first part of the guidance that they have for coding a table of contents for your book. You know, in K through 12, uh, if it's a textbook, it's almost always going to have a table of contents. And so this can be very helpful in terms of getting guidance for how to correctly do that. Again, we have that same basic structure for the entry, and that is then followed by uh, several examples in this particular case. And so, um, again, it's just uh, the DAISY structure guidelines are, they're available online. They're, they're always there as a resource. And I think that they're, uh, again, they're easy to use and they just help ensure that your files are correctly tagged and that they will be usable when uh, a kid out in the States needs an accessible version of your textbook. Um, one caveat, of course, is, is that no documentation is ever completely exhaustive. If you have questions that you aren't able to resolve, whether it has to do with applying uh, the tags correctly or a general question about the specification, please uh, do feel free to get in touch. As I mentioned, the National AIM Center, uh, you know, they kind of uh, also assist us with providing technical assistance in that area. If we're, we actually kind of tag team with that. Um, if you recently received and responded to the survey that we sent, we actually sent a joint survey out to NIMAC users and to publishers and vendors um, to specifically get some feedback on resources that are available uh, from the National AIM Center because we're actually currently in the process of helping them out uh, with updating those resources and they're in the process of kind of revamping their website. So um, if you haven't been to the AIM Center website to look at those resources, that is also a location that you can go to to find other guidance. I'm Nicole. Uh, before we move on, there is a good question in the chat related to the DAISY guidelines. Okay. So, um, uh, David put this in and he, and he says, uh, tagging methods allowed by DAISY can be quite complex and contextually specific. Is it true that any DAISY tagging options used in a NIMAS submission will be valid and NIMAC compliant? Do end users of the NIMAS files welcome the added complexity of DAISY tagging? Yeah, I think that, um, David, what you're pointing to is that despite the kind of the prescriptive nature of the structure guidelines, that there is a lot of, um, there is still a lot of flexibility in terms of how you might interpret a specific situation. And frankly, uh, the variability is, is it causes headaches for users, actually. And um, so it's kind of one of those, it's a kind of a catch-22 where the advantage of DAISY is that there's there's enough complexity so that there's specificity for different structures. For example, you there are specific tags where you can tag a glossary in a certain way. You know, you tag the table of contents as a nested list, that kind of thing. But there are other situations where people may apply other tags. It's not exhaustive in terms of you must always handle this situation in this way. Um, and frankly, that variability does create challenges. It creates challenges. And I think that it's just part of that, though, is just inherent in way back when that National File Format Committee decided that, hey, we're going to use a subset of DAISY in order to have this source file format. And it just kind of comes along with the territory. So I do, but I will very much acknowledge that that variability can be challenging. So getting back in terms of the NIMAC website, I had mentioned that, that this presentation 
and the PowerPoint will be posted there. And there are also other um, training videos that are made available there. I will just make a, a side note that we're currently in the process of, of working on a series of shorter videos that are more task oriented, for example, using the validation wizard creating new users and that kind of thing. So if you're ever just needing a refresher on a specific thing, this is also a place where going forward, you, uh, you will be able to find some guidance with a lot of those specific tasks as well. And this is just our homepage, nimac.us, and I have circled here where the link to the specific page for publishers and conversion vendors is found. So the next section here in terms of, of providing NIMAS files is supplying the metadata. All NIMAS files are required to include metadata in the OPF for the file set. And this part is really important uh, because it's essential to ensuring that folks can find your materials once you have provided them to the NIMAC. So in terms of when you supply your files to the NIMAC, Again, the automated validation is the first part of the process. If they pass that, then there's a second part, which is primarily the metadata review. There are a few checks that we make with regard to the XML and other file set components, but by and large, the metadata review is really the focus of the manual review process. Um, the NIMAC metadata guidelines can be downloaded from the website anytime, uh, and they um, should be used as the guidance for correctly submitting the metadata. And just as kind of a side note here, I think that um, we're all kind of used to Google and the power of Google to be able to put something that's sort of similar to what we're looking for into the search box. And hey, it, it came up anyway, even though I misspelled most of the words, it's kind of amazing what Google can do. And I, I feel like it can be kind of helpful to note that in our search interface, it's a much more modest search. Um, that We do have a text box search that includes title, author, series, ISBN, and identifier. And then we have those pick list uh, filters for other metadata. And so for all of those pick list filters, um, as well as for the other metadata, it's, um, it's a fairly precise kind of uh, searching and matching to find the search results. And so um, this is kind of one reason why, uh, for example, if you ever get feedback that, you know, we have the imprint for this particular publisher set up in the system this way, and you've made a slight variation here, we really just need you to, you know, conform and use the previously established version, that's because, you know, when you have a pick list search, you really don't want to have, um, you know, five different variations for what's basically the same publisher, uh, if you can avoid it. Um, so this is kind of why we get a little picky sometimes in terms of, of really wanting to, to get the metadata right. Uh, in terms of the system records, the other uh, reason that, that the OPF metadata is really important is that this is how the system records are created for your inventory. When you log into your account, you're going to see uh, bibliographic records for every file that you have submitted to the repository, and that comes out of the OPFs that you provide. When you upload the file, whether or not it's something that you've delivered by FTP, or whether it's something that you've manually uploaded, the system is gonna pull the metadata right out of that OPF and put it into the system. So at a practical level, if you are missing required metadata or it's formatted uh, with the incorrect tags or required tags are missing, um, it will cause your, it, it can cause your metadata extraction and your upload to fail. So this is just something we also want you to avoid. Um, in some cases, if you, uh, are manually uploading files and you leave something out, the nice thing is that uh, in a lot of cases, the system will just show you uh, on the edit page, and we kind of looked at this at our earlier, uh, in the earlier webinar, that we will get an edit screen that shows you all of the metadata that was extracted from your OPF, and you can actually add or make changes from that screen, and that will be saved to your OPF. So you can actually, there's actually some flexibility a lot of the time in the system, but if things are really, really wonky, the system will just say, I can't, I can't deal with your OPF, uh, you're going to have to fix it. Um, 
So the next thing I want to talk about uh, a little bit is just what our metadata review encompasses. Um, there's really not a lot of mystery to it in terms of what we're doing to verify the, the contents of the file set that you've submitted. Obviously, one thing that we just want to be sure of is that when you're providing a file set, you know, we've got that PDF. Uh, of the title page or cover and the copyright page. And that that's how we identify, that's what this file said, that's the book that it should be. So you know, one of the things that we're doing there is we're looking at that PDF, we're comparing that to the OPF, and we're comparing it also to the XML. You know, does, is the title page that's transcribed in the XML, does it match that PDF? Is it for a different book? Is the ISBN in that XML file the same ISBN that's in the uh, PDF or is it a different one? Um, so th that's just really important to, to just ensure that what that all of these file set components match each other and that the metadata matches the book. Another thing that we routinely do during that file review process is that we will routinely make minor metadata corrections at the point of file review. Similarly to the way that you can make edits to your metadata at the point of upload, we can also go in and make these edits once files have been uploaded to the system. So say, for example, you've, you've submitted a file and it incorrectly says Florida edition, it's actually a national edition, that's a simple change. We will routinely make changes like that and, and save the change just so that we can move forward and certify the file. If we are ever in a position where we're not sure, of course, we would go back and say, you know, we're not able to actually determine, does it look like the Florida edition? You know, can you let us know, you know, what, what the correct edition is and so forth. So, um, but in cases where it's a, a, just a very straightforward uh, issue, we will go ahead and, uh, and fix those. Um, but it may be the case if there are metadata issues that are extensive or if they affect a large number of files, you know, uh, there, there may be cases where we would have to ask the vendor to go back and make, make corrections and resubmit the files. But we do try to avoid that as much as possible. And, uh, and yeah, generally it's very, very rare that uh, files have to be resubmitted just because of metadata issues. They're almost always, uh, resubmitted because there's some other issue that affects the XML or the PDF or image files, files that we are not able to make any kind of changes to. So again, if you're new to the NIMAC or if you just have questions, uh, we just encourage you to look at the metadata guidelines. And um, we're also happy to help you to get started. One of the things that we find, especially with newer publishers or newer vendors, is a lot of times if they can just get one good OPF template together, uh, they're good. You know, it's kind of like once you have a clear understanding of these are the metadata that are required and just make sure that you use these tags each time and you know if you have questions about how to provide specific metadata we're happy to help with that um, but most of the time once you've got a good OPF template together uh, it goes pretty smoothly after that. One of the other things that we're happy to do is that uh, if you have a specific title that is very different from what you've submitted before or a brand new program that has a lot of different components or a series that has a sub-series or um, just whatever it might be, we're happy to help with any queries that you have. You can just email us at nimac at aph.org. And, uh, you know, it's, it's actually not uncommon. We actually have a, a few different vendors who, if they have questions, they will send us the, uh, the title page, copyright page PDF, and the metadata that they have pulled together. And, and they'll just say, is this, is this, are we on the right track? And we're happy to take a look at that. Um, and again, this can be super helpful, especially if you've got, um, a really large program, a brand new program. You know, it's much better. We're happy to take a look and just kind of smooth out any issues so that we're not in a situation where there are 200 files that that all have the wrong copy right here, for example, or they all have the wrong series statement or, or whatever it could be. 
And then the last thing that I want to talk about in terms of the, the OPF metadata, there is a tool in the system that's been available for, for actually quite a while, and it's optional. If it's helpful for you, we encourage you to, to, to try it out. Um, and if it's not something that can work with your workflow, then that's okay too. But uh, what it is, is it's a tool that will uh, import a completed Excel sheet and generate OPF metadata for you uh, that is correctly tagged and correctly formatted. Um, and it's actually, in terms of the way that it works, it's super simple. Um, you basically uh, take the template that we make available, you fill out one line in the sheet for each uh, book that you want to create the OPF for, each file that you want to create an OPF for, and it will do that that formatting for you, the tagging for you, and it'll email you a zip file with one OPF or starter OPF uh, for each one of those files. Um, we call them starter OPFs because they're not the completed OPF. You do still need to include the manifest and spine portion of the OPF before you zip it up with your uh, file set, but uh, it takes care of that, uh, the metadata part for you. And so specifically, it can help reduce any metadata errors uh, for things like uh, subjects or formatting grade level correctly or state edition correctly or that kind of thing. It just it can really kind of uh, streamline that that whole part of it. And so this is just a this is just a screenshot here of the actual. Uh, uh, template here, and I've actually I've filled it out with just some kind of uh, uh, sample information. And then what happens is that the system will send you this back. It will actually send you the OPF with all of the information that you've put in the sheet uh, in an OPF. So um, that's that sheet. If you're interested in giving it a whirl, just giving it a try. It's available on our website. It's also available on the resources page of your account. If you're logged into the NIMAC, you can go and, uh, you know, you can't hurt anything by playing around with the tool. So if you want to go in and just check it out, if you have any uh, questions, if you find that you uh, you know, have any issues, or you find that if your sheet is not processing correctly, let us know and we can help you troubleshoot that. It's one of those things where the, um, the it, it is very picky. And we, you know, one of the things that we always let folks know is you don't want to add or remove columns to the template itself. It's very specific in terms of, of that, you know, the, the sheet that we make available is the only one that you can actually use with the tool. And this is, again, just where you find that if you're logged into the system, if you click on transform Excel to OPF, it's a super simple uh, process. Actually, there's a gray button where, that you click, you navigate to the Excel sheet, and then you click the blue button that says convert to OPF. That's it. Um, and then you will get a confirmation uh, upload successful and uh, pretty much instantly you will hear your email ding and you will see that there is an email that you receive and this is actually what the automated email looks like. It will just tell you that you have a zip file here and it has your OPF files and you can download them and uh, go on your merry way. So, okay, so we've, we've talked a bit about the specification the structure guidelines, the metadata requirements, and now we are, everything is great, we're happy with our files. The very last step before you actually deliver your files or try to upload them is to do the automated validation of your files. Um, we ask that all files be validated using the NIMAC validation wizard. Uh, this is, if you have other XML validation tools, of course, you're welcome to use those as well, but there are a couple of additional checks uh, specifically for NIMIS that are included in the validation wizard. So it's just a good idea. Um, basically, it can just save you some time. Um, if a file doesn't pass validation, uh, the system will not accept it for upload, uh, whether that's manually or through the FTP process. So uh, it's just it can just kind of save you some time to just be aware that there, there are no issues with that 
particular part of it. In terms of the validation wizard itself, I will be the first to acknowledge that the, um, the wizard is kind of old now. And one of the things on our wish list that we're looking to do in the next couple of years, um, things sometimes move more slowly than we would like, but uh, is we are gonna have our system vendor develop a new validation wizard, uh, which we hope um, we hope for a couple of things. First of all, we do hope that we will have, uh, we, well, we were planning to require that they provide a version that is Mac compatible. Uh, the current tool is only a Windows uh, based program. And so unfortunately it will not run on a Mac machine. Uh, and then we would also like to kind of look at uh, extending the kinds of checks that are available. Um, if you have uh, uploaded files through the uh, system, you will notice that with the metadata extraction, there are times, or even with the FTP, you know, there are uh, some metadata issues that will prevent the files from upload, but because the validation wizard does not look at your metadata, not all of those issues can be found. And so we, we kind of want to, uh, you know, try to make the validation wizard a little better tool going forward. It's fairly basic now, but it is still an important tool to use before you submit files. So if you need to access it, it's available at any time on the resources tab. Just download it, click it, zoom. It's a really small uh, program actually. So what does it do and what doesn't it do? Basically, the it does a, a basic XML check to make sure that the XML is well formed. Uh, and, it, and also that it validates to any DTD that is included there, and that'll always include the NINUS DTD. Uh, and if the file includes MathML, it'll include the MathML DTD as well. So it does that. Uh, and then the, an additional check that it does is it will ensure that any, re any image that's referenced in your XML file or in the OPF manifest are present in the images folder. Uh, things that it doesn't do, I mentioned that it, it doesn't evaluate your metadata. If there are metadata issues, your val the validation wizard will not find those. Uh, and it can also not evaluate the completeness of the content of the file or, or your tagging decisions. So again, uh, and then a third thing that it doesn't do is it, it's not able to detect extraneous files in the zip archive. Um, one of the things we'll kind of mention later is that some, some processes will result in creating extraneous files and we don't really want anything in the zip file except the uh, the actual components required for NIMIS. When you open the validation wizard, we're gonna just kind of look at a series of screens here that just show you what that tool looks like. Uh, when you click the next button, you're gonna get to a screen that gives you two different options for validation. And so the top option, it says validate OEB package file. That's um, the actual OPF for the file. And if you navigate to that file using that top box, that will, that will um, validate your entire unzipped file set. So one thing that's important is that it can't be zipped already, it needs to be unzipped. Uh, but if you if you navigate there, that's how that's really what where you want to go to when you're completely finished with your with your project. You, you as far as you're concerned, it's ready. It's ready to roll. And then you use that first option. There is a second option below that validate XML source file. If you're working with just the XML, you're concerned that there might be some issues, you do have the option to just validate the XML file uh, to make sure that that's okay if that's, if that's something that's useful for you. If you choose that first option, however, you do not have to go back and choose that second option and validate again. The first option does include the XML. And the rest of it is really pretty straightforward. You know, it's the kind of interface that I'm sure you've seen many times. You just navigate to where your OPF resides again with the rest of the unzipped file set. Click next, you'll see a little progress bar, and then you're gonna get your, your results. And of course, uh, in terms of the output, it's going to actually give you a section for any issues uh, related to the OPF and another section related to the XML. And what we're really after here is zero errors and zero warnings. If you have errors and you wanna export, there is an option to export the search results. Uh, but, and then you can also, if you wanted to copy them out of the window and paste them somewhere, that's also an option. Any validation errors that come up in the tool, you just want to be sure that you 
correct them before you submit the file set. And as an aside, uh, the output, if there are errors, sometimes the output will actually tell you uh, the error above may have stopped the validator. Uh, and that's actually intentional. There are some types of errors where it doesn't want to create, uh, you know, if you've got something that's not right in many thousands of lines in the XML, it doesn't want to generate many thousands of errors. So there are certain types of errors that will just stop. So uh, after making any corrections, you may want to, well, you will want to run the file through again, just to make sure that you've caught any issues. Uh, if it was a repeating issue, uh, and that there are no additional things that need to be addressed. So, uh, and it also kind of along with this is that after you zip your file, it's all valid, it's all great, we're ready to roll. Uh, one really quick and easy check that we suggest that folks do before you deliver your file or, or attempt to upload it to the system is to just click on it and make sure that it opens up again. It's not very common, but every now and then a file compression process will, will corrupt the file. And, you know, so every now and then, you know, you, you, you may have seen it in the past where you've gotten a, an FTP daily batch report and it just it sell, it tells you that the, the zip file was corrupt. Again, it doesn't happen very often, but we can you can prevent that just by kind of giving that a click. If it opens, it's probably okay, probably not corrupt, probably good to deliver. So before we move on to talk about file submission, the batch submission process, I just want to point out just a few quick reminders of things that we sometimes see with files uh, that can delay certification because they're, they're things that are important to address um, or they're just things that can make life simpler for you if you uh, kind of keep them in mind as you're producing your files. The first one is that, uh, you know, we all know that the doc title, uh, well, or you may not know, but I'll, so I'll tell you, the doc title is a tag that is required in the, uh, at the top of your XML file. Um, but even if you include the doc title, as you should, uh, it is still important that you provide the title page transcription in the XML file. Um, uh, many uh, software conversion processes, they may entirely disregard the doc title and doc author information that's at the, at the top of your XML file. Uh, and we want to ensure that all of that essential bibliographic information, that it's present. If somebody takes that file and creates a, an automated Braille file, or they are they create a file that is uh, an MP3 for somebody who needs to listen to it, uh, we don't want the contents of your book to start on the copyright page. We actually had, um, I believe I mentioned this at, 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 an, at the other webinar, but um, we actually had a, a file that we got the other day that was exactly that situation, that the, the title page had not been transcribed at all in the XML. So when the file was actually converted, uh, it, there was no title, there was no author, there was no publisher imprint. You know, there was no series statement, there was no grade. It started at the copyright page. And so it's just really important to make sure that that, that those preliminary pages are included. Uh, in cases, and, and this is not unusual for K through 12 materials, sometimes there's not really a true title page. And the actual, uh, there are cases sometimes when the ISBN or the publisher name or the complete title, state editions, sometimes this essential information is only found on the front cover or the back cover. And in those cases, that information uh, has to be transcribed in the XML as well. And again, this is, this is um, simply to make sure that that complete information about the book, that that's available in any accessible format that the student in the classroom is using, just like it would be for a kid who's using the regular book. Another issue that comes up sometimes uh, with the files is that it's really important to make sure that your that your PDF is complete. And again, just to reiterate, we don't ever receive PDFs for the complete textbook. We are only getting the PDFs for the pages of the uh, where the essential bibliographic information is found, uh, wherever that's found. Commonly, it's the title page and the copyright page. A lot of times, that's where it all is. Um, but basically, it's wherever you find the complete title, the ISBN, the copyright statement, 
publisher and print at, at, at a minimum. That, that's where we're going to find all of that, that key information. Again, if that is only found on the covers, please include the cover PDF, uh, the cover PDFs as well. And we don't need separate files. Uh, we don't need high quality files uh, for this. Again, um, the PDF is only used for file verification. You know, it can be used by us in our file review, and it's also made available so that teachers can do that exact same thing or Braille transcribers can do the same thing. When they download the file, they can take a look at that and they can verify, yes, that matches, you know, before I go and transcribe this book and, you know, spend a lot of time creating the Braille version, you know, I can go and verify, yes, this is definitely the same book that they're using in the classroom and I'm on the right track. So when it comes to the PDF, um, it's not used in the production of any accessible format, so it doesn't have to be high quality. It doesn't have to be a big file. Um, occasionally, we will have situations where we will get really huge, you know, title page cover uh, PDFs from the vendor, and um, and they're beautiful, but it, but it really don't need them. Uh, they're having a forty or fifty uh, uh, megabyte. PDF for the for the cover and title page and copyright page. It will add to download times, but it doesn't really add value to the user. So if you're if you're going out of your way to ensure that those are really beautiful files, please please don't worry about it. They don't have to be. Another thing that can commonly come up, and this is one of those things where uh, there's a little bit of variation between the DAISY specification and the NIMA specification. And so, you know, most of the time there's kind of a beautiful convergence there and they dovetail very well. But in the case of full DAISY, uh, it is a uh, completely acceptable to include metadata in the XML file itself. And that's done by, by including metadata in the head tag. Uh, in, in NIMIS, this is not the case. The NIMIS specification actually calls for that tag to be empty. Uh, and from a practical standpoint, including non-NIMIS metadata in the XML file can actually delay certification. Sometimes it's a little, it ends up looking weird or it's not correct and we just end up asking the vendor, please just take this out. We don't want to confuse the user. So um, bottom line for NIMIS, that OPF, go, that excuse me, that metadata goes in the OPF, don't put it in the XML, just put it in the OPF and don't think about putting it in the XML file. And then the last thing, uh, I kind of re uh, referred to this a little bit earlier, that one of the things the validation wizard can't do is it can't detect if there's something in the zip file that doesn't belong there. And this is something that we're, we're also going to look into when we rebuild the tool is, you know, hey, can we update this so that it can actually make sure there isn't anything that's weird in there. Um, one of the most common things that can happen is if you are working on a Mac, uh, sometimes the compression utility that that a Mac offers will generate some extraneous files that are there in your zip file. And sometimes they even look like empty files, but they're 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 physically, well, as physical as the ones and zeros are, but they are there in the file and um, they can actually cause the upload process to fail. Uh, it's mysterious. It's mysterious. I can't really explain to you why, but the long and short of it is we just don't want any files uh, extraneous files in the zip archive. You know, it should be the images folder, the OPF, the XML, the PDF, nothing else. If you've zipped up your file and you click it and you open it up and, hey, there's an extra folder there that has a strange name and you don't know what it is, uh, go back in, check your settings, see if you can figure out uh, a way to uh, re-zip the file that doesn't generate those. And if you need any help, just let us know. We can. Uh, we may not have the answer ourselves, but we'd be happy to help you uh, get some help with Overdrive to troubleshoot that. Another thing that, that we had come up before is that we know of at least one state that routinely asks publishers to send a screenshot of the NIMAC validation wizard showing that their file passed. Um, and this is something where if your file is actually uploaded to our system successfully uh, and it's certified, by definition it has passed, but this is neither here nor there. It's kind of like if your customer's telling you that they want it, you're going to give it to them anyway. But um, 
if you receive a request like that for any sort of extra thing, please don't zip it up in the file set itself. Um, find some other way to get it to your customer. Uh, we just don't want anything that's not the NIMAS file set itself. In the zip file, uh, it can cause confusion at the point of using the file, uh, or again, it might cause a problem with actually uploading the file. So the last piece of the reminders is I just wanted to note, uh, in recent years, we've been getting more files with math and all, which is really great. Um, it's really helpful. Uh, if you don't provide MathML or if you're not familiar with it, it is optional markup for NIMAS that makes math and scientific notation accessible or potentially accessible when software can support that code. Um, and I just want to point uh, you guys that to a short guidance document that's on our website that actually uh, provides the information that, that I'm going to cover in the following screens, because I'm going to kind of whiz through it pretty quickly, uh, because I mostly just kind of want to just make a quick note. Uh, the first quick note that I want to make is that whether you're providing MathML 3 or MathML 2, the declaration format is a little different for those. That guidance document that I refer to includes templates for both of those. Um, the main thing is that MathML 2, this little section in red here, is not valid for MathML 3. And so uh, in the document, we pro provide examples of both. And you can use those uh, when, you're when you're producing your files to, to just simplify that. Fallback images, we do like to uh, reiterate to folks that if you include MathML, uh, we do ask that you still supply fallback images. Uh, and this is simply because the state of the technology is that MathML is still unfortunately not as widely supported as we wish that it was. So we do still need to ask that math equations be provided as image files, uh, and those should be referenced on the alt image attribute of your math tags. Alt text, similarly to alt text for NIMAS in, as a whole, it's not required for MathML, uh, but the alt text image, I'm sorry, the alt text attribute is required to be present. So I have like a little example tag here where I've got alt text equals and then just quotation mark, quotation mark. That's what it'll look like if you, you know, on your tag. And you just want to make sure that it is, it's present there because it's, it's just a requirement. Um, the other thing that we like to just note is that uh, if you, again, it, it's optional, you don't have to require, you don't have to provide a description of the math expression, uh, but if you don't, please just leave it empty. Occasionally we will get files where uh, the vendor has put the image file name or a word, the word image or the word math. Uh, that uh, kind of placeholder text is really not helpful. It's better uh, to just leave that out because it, it ends up having to just be stripped out later unless the software can just automatically ignore it. So before I move on, the, the, the last piece here, we're going to talk about uh, the batch delivery process, but I do want to take a moment and just ask if there are any other questions about what we've covered so far. We kind of kind of thrown a lot at you this afternoon. So I just wanted to take a breath real quickly and see if there are any questions and I'll take a look at the chat to see if I if anything comes through. Okay, I'm not seeing anything. So I will move on ahead here. Um, so basically for the last Part here, I want to just talk a little bit about batch delivery. This is the most common way for us to receive files. Um, files that are up to 300 megabytes can be manually uploaded one at a time. Um, due to your upload times, we generally recommend that if it's 250 or bigger FTPs, the better option. Uh, there's no minimum or maximum file size for submitting files by FTP. So what happens when you deliver files by FTP is that they basically, um, we are located in Louisville, Kentucky. Overdrive is located in Cleveland, Ohio. And so when you FTP the files, they actually go 
right to overdrive and they provide that batch processing service for us. So that's why when you see the FTP location, it's transfer.overdrive.com. That's where you're actually sending those files. Uh, and if you do not yet have an FTP login, you can request one by emailing your NIMAC login ID to overdrive at nimac-support at overdrive.com. One thing that we do recommend for publishers is that if you uh, are going to be having your conversion vendors submit files, we ask that you go ahead and create vendor accounts for those folks so that they can request their own FTP login. Um, the uh, this will be. This will actually uh, be important. We'll talk a little bit more about the FTP reports in a moment, but um, it can just kind of make the communication easier with regard to to that because that the FTP login is going to be associated with the email address of the person who established that account. So, um, if you are a vendor, you're going to need a separate FTP login for each publisher account that you work with. Uh, but again, it's it's pretty quick and easy to get an FTP account set up for you. When it's time for you to submit your files, uh, again, pretty straightforward uh, sort of drag and drop situation. Um, but one thing to keep in mind, especially if uh, if you're if you're used to doing FTP, and you know a lot of times when folks are FTPing and sharing information, it's very very common to put files in folders. To, you know, to so and so from so and so. That's very very a, just a very very common kind of protocol. In the case of delivering files, though, please don't use folders or subfolders or any kind of folder structure on the FTP. And the reason for this is that when the automated process goes through and looks through all of those FTP. Uh, you know, all through the FTP for all of the users, uh, it is looking for those files with the zip file extension, right? So if you've got a, your zip files hidden in a folder, it's not going to find them. It's not going to find them. It's not going to be able to grab them. It's not going to be able to process them. So um, if you ever uh, have a situation where you're, uh, you, you've delivered files, but the next day you didn't get a report, one thing that you might ask yourself is, I didn't put those in a folder, did I? Because that's the other caveat there is that if the system didn't find your files to process them, you're not going to get a report for those files. So anyway, long and short of it, don't use folders. So the batch delivery report, uh, in terms of the way that this works, whatever time during the business day, you know, we're on Easter Eastern time where we are, uh, you may be uh, on the West Coast, you could be in the middle of the country. But basically, the way that the uh, FTP batch processing works is that it pretty much happens about 3 o'clock in the morning Eastern time. So it, that pretty much covers the business day for the whole continental USA. It's like if you've if you've submitted files on a particular day that night, they're going to be they're going to be processed, and then the next morning or or later the next morning, you're going to receive an automated report that gives you the processing results. And so that report is going to go to the user whose email is associated with the FTP login. And so again, this is kind of um, another reason why, you know, if you're a publisher who's working with several vendors, you really don't want to set up an FTP for yourself and then share that login with a bunch of different folks because that just means that you're going to get that report every morning, but you may not be the person who needs to get it to actually fix any issues. So just better to have that actual login associated with whoever's actually uploading the files. From our standpoint, it's also very helpful uh, because one of the other things that happens is when that metadata extraction happens for your batch delivery, or actually it, it kind of is the same if you're uploading through the portal, the system actually does create an audit trail entry for whoever uploaded the file. And when it comes to the FTP login, uh, the FTP, that audit trail is going to show, you know, whatever email address was associated with that. And so it's kind of like from our standpoint, if there's a problem with the file, what we'll do is we go to, back to that audit trail. And if we see the, you know, administrative account holder for the publisher, uh, but it's actually, you know, vendor B over here who really needs to address the issue. It's just a lot more, the communication is just a lot more direct. We can get issues addressed more quickly if we can actually see 
who uploaded uh, or actually who who is responsible and who actually did upload the file rather than uh, the email address of somebody else who was not directly involved. So similarly, again, if you're a vendor, you know, you're going to have a separate login for each publisher and you're also going to get a separate report for each publisher if you submit files on a particular day for more than one publisher. One thing that's really important, if you worked with the NIMAC before we moved to this more automated process, uh, you may recall that we used to have a tracking system where there were tracking tickets and you had to send a notification and then you got a tracking number and all of that is gone. So um, the beauty of that is that you no longer have to provide any sort of separate notification when you deliver files by FTP. It's just, it's gone entirely. But Thing that you have to keep in mind is that because that tracking system no longer exists, your daily report, that is your notification uh, if there is an issue that a delivery has failed or you know there was a problem with the file. So you just want to ensure that whenever you get that email, if you get that email in the morning, open it up, take a look because that's that's where you're going to see if there are any issues. If you look at the top of the report and it says success for everything, then you're done. You don't have to look at the rest of the report, but you just want to make sure to verify because if there are any issues, uh, that is your notification of what the issue is uh, so that you can fix it. This is an actual report of, uh, uh, this, uh, sorry, this is an actual screenshot of a report that shows two new titles were processed, two resubmission titles were processed, and all four were successful. And then this is a report that shows that there were uh, three successful deliveries, but one failed delivery due to validation issues. And similarly to the validation wizard, you will get the details of, of any problem in that details column. So generally speaking, the details that you're going to see in that report are going to be, uh, they're going to be, uh, it, it's going to provide you enough detail to know what the issue is. But of course, if you ever have any questions, feel free to get in touch and let us know. So this, this is just a, a, a spot, a chart here where I'm showing some different possible failures. I'm not going to go through each of these individually, but uh, it's just some different examples of what that detail screen will show with different types of problems. If you have an imprint that's not associated with your account, it will tell you. If you have missing required metadata, it will specify what needs to be included. So uh, anyway, so if you have any questions, let us know, but hopefully it'll mostly be pretty easy to understand. When you correct the file, correct the issue, just deliver again by FTP. And that new file will, you know, show up the next day. You'll get a confirmation that it's been successful if you've corrected the issue, and you will be good to go. Um, one caveat here: I do want to note that certified inventory is kind of a protected status, uh, and the system will prevent you from replacing a file that's already in certified. We just don't want anybody to accidentally host a file that's good and there's not an issue with it. So if you do need to intentionally resubmit a file, let us know. We're happy to move those files into stalled inventory where they can be replaced. So again, when you when you provide a file uh, by FTP, whether it is a resubmission or a new file, it will automatically uh, show up in uncertified and that's our indication that uh, it's, it's in the file review queue and we can look at it. Generally, we do review items in the order they are submitted, but we're always happy to expedite files, prioritize files when there's an immediate need. So if you ever have a situation like that, please let us know. We're really happy to, you know, to make sure that we focus on anything that uh, there's a need for right away. And of course, like it, as with any, uh, any file that's in the review process, if we have any questions or feedback, we will get in touch and let you know. And that is, yeah, that is the that is the file review process. And uh, that basically wraps up what I wanted to cover today. Uh, we are 
right at the top of the hour. And I am more than happy if there are any questions, I can I can stick around if there are any questions. I know we really kind of close, but and I also just wanted to let folks know Liz has just put in the chat a link to a very short, it's three short questions um, that uh, for an evaluation of the webinar. If you have just a minute that you could uh, respond to that, that actually will be really helpful for us as we go forward. We really, we really take a look at any of the feedback that we get to uh, to help uh, help us figure out what training would be good to offer going forward. So, uh, if again, if there's anything that anyone would like to ask, you're welcome to do so. And if not, thank, uh, thanks to everyone for joining us this afternoon. We appreciate you taking the time to, to be with us. Thanks very much.